think uh, I strongly believe that a person's upbringing and surroundings really influence their risk-taking abilities. Right? Um, I was born and brought up in a rather quiet part of Mumbai city. Uh, you know, I went to a state board school and every day during lunch I'd come back when I was much younger and sit at that exact window um, and watch National Geographic or, or Discovery Channel or look outside the window at nature. Right? And so that built a fascination towards environment, climate, and wildlife while I was growing up. The interesting part was that our parents' generation, or, or even my parents' generation and some of your generation, grew up with the promise of an exciting future, where if you work hard and you build a career, the future is going to be great. But my generation grew up with the promise of a bleak future, where animals are extinct, uh, the water is polluted, iceberg is uh, melting, climate change is real, deforestation is real, the air is polluted. And that's not a very exciting future to wake up to every single day and work hard towards, no matter how much money you make. Right? So this built a strong discomfort in me growing up. And as I started to find my interest in science and building things, and uh, you know, so I was very young, I was building different projects and products on my own. I didn't have a PlayStation, but I always had the freedom to learn and build whatever I wanted. And I think that's something I owe to my parents uh, for being so supportive. Um, and as I kept building things and got more used to realizing how the world around us worked, I just simply could not understand why we're not taking climate change as seriously when the future is not exciting for my generation. Either people didn't care or they didn't know. Uh, either way, that was affecting our generation, right? Um, and so. I was fortunate that in my journey of, of building things, while I did well academically in school, uh, in ninth grade I dropped out of school because I didn't like the rote learning, uh, you know, uh, methodology in teaching. And uh, when I dropped out, I got exposed to something very dangerous, thriving in autonomy, right? In India, we are quite used to being told what to do um, and we wait for the next instruction. But when you're put out in the real world without systems, you have to thrive in the real world on your own, right? And so we're, I was very fortunate to get to work with some incredibly smart people in India and the United States between MIT and doing projects with doctors and, and PhDs here. Uh, soon to realize that the world around us was built just by people like us and that we had the ability to influence it and do something meaningful from it. But while I was doing it, that discomfort continued where what exactly am I doing every single day when you know the future is not that great? Um, and so eventually I went back to school, I studied electrical engineering at Georgia Tech, and during that time I've worked on electric vehicles, I've built battery packs, uh, you know, to power uh, small, I think 250 homes in Haiti. Um, you know, we built that project from scratch to run it on renewable energy. And as I kept working in that, uh, I started what eventually became my startup Tran uh, in 2017. And so of all the problems in climate, I was trying to understand which is one uh, that cannot be solved with, you know, in the short term with EVs or over time move to uh, renewable energy and sustainability. And that was a glaring problem in climate, check, climate change and public health, and that's the problem of air pollution, right? Um, so COVID-19 as a pandemic killed about three and a half million people in the first year uh, of the pandemic. Air pollution kills 7 million people every single year. We don't take it nearly as seriously, right? Uh, there are about 250 million vehicles in India that must be converted to EVs and then power them on renewable energy. This is no walk in the park. Uh, Tesla just revealed their largest factory a couple of days ago and that factory too just has the capability of making 500,000 cars a year at optimal capacity. So just imagine the time and infrastructure is going to take to convert 250 million vehicles uh, to electric, right? And then just this past winter, more than 1 million students couldn't go to school because of air pollution. I don't think any of us grew up in the time where we didn't go to school because the air was too bad outside, right? But that's an unfortunate reality of our, our time. And I think just to think about why we're not thinking about this problem, we eat three to four times a day. We drink water several times a day but we breathe 22,000 times a day. So if we're putting thought into what we're eating and what we're drinking, why not what we're breathing, right? And so for very long, I waited on other people to do something about it, be it government, experts, um, or you know, professors in, in different parts of the world. 
Um, soon to realize that the solutions seem to be what my mentor calls chasing rainbows, right? Where there were illusions but not truly solutions that were scalable. So, you know, there are masks and nasal filters and after COVID we realize how much we don't like using them. And in Delhi, these anti-smoke guns have become popular. They cost between 5 and 18 lakh rupees each. And some of them dispense up to 4,000 liters of water an hour. So not the most sustainable solution uh, for mitigation of air pollution. And then there are these smoke-free towers, you know, in, whether built in Europe or, or in India by the government, cost between 100,000 and $2 million. The one in Delhi is $2 million. Um, that's one random tower placed with a promise of purifying several kilometers of, of air using HEPA filters, right? From a science perspective itself, if you look at the volume that it's purifying per day, and let's assume the high, exact height of the, the tower, you will still not get a range of two kilometers. So, you know, rainbows, uh, not really solutions. Um, and so that's why I said we're going to do something about it. And I knew nothing about air purification, air pollution, and then soon realized it's a very, very nuanced problem, right? Uh, because fundamentally there are infinite sources. I can't just go tackle all the sources, it's impossible. Like from the paint on your wall degrading to your vehicle, uh, you know, these are all sources of particulate matter, air pollution. I can't stop trees from, uh, you know, throwing out pollen and, and other particulate matter, or this, the wind from carrying dust from uh, Rajasthan or other places into uh, New Delhi. Um, and then there was too much misinformation, too much negativity. People are scaring everyone about air purification uh, and air pollution. When you start scaring people, no one wants to talk to you, right? And so you have to make it very exciting and aspirational and futuristic for people to want to, you know, t take this conversation seriously. Um, and there were just so many different types of air pollutants. There are different materials, different sizes. It was very difficult to even build sensors to capture this accurately. So just building test rigs was a monumental task for Pran um, when, when we started it. And so here's what we decided to build. We took a, an extraordinarily hard problem and then made it harder for ourselves by saying we're going to make it aspirational and build, some, build something really cool such that it's filterless, right? All existing air purifiers have HEPA filters, activated carbon filters. We said we're going to make it filterless so there's no recurring costs involved. Uh, we're going to make it low cost, even a government school can adopt the technologies that we're building. We're going to make it aspirational and futuristic, where people love the product and they want to talk to 50 other people about it, right? Um, and then you want to be able to scale it without government. We've always had the belief system that use government as a partner, not as a customer, right? So you want access to something, talk to them, but don't go and chase them for money. Because there are few companies which cause majority of the pollution in our, in our country but then the taxpayer is, is expected to offset that, right? Whereas there's enough and more CSR and other budgets, even natural budgets if you make the product exciting enough where people will adopt it, right? Um, and so we, we, we said we're going to make it scalable without government. It should no, need new, new infrastructure and it should be intelligent and weatherproof. And then to increase the problem by orders of magnitude, we said we're going to make it in India um, and set up production facilities here. Um, and so, you know, there's a belief system that if you want to try to build something crazy and very, you know, that solves a big problem, you need big money. We need big money at scale. You don't need big money to start. So when we started, we did it without any money, bootstrapped it for four years. Um, you know, I was a student in the US. I had a student visa. I couldn't build a company on that visa or raise venture capital. It was also in the moonshot category, still falls in the moonshot category to build it. That's my bedroom we used as a lab, parking lots, tailpipes of cars as emission sources. Um, you know, living room of a friend that we used as a test trick center. And then park benches to do some sensor trials. And then in the middle, we didn't get access to incubators for our biotech projects. We built our own, right? So I don't think you need a lot of money with to... Uh, just, uh, um, and I think on a, on a higher level, what's very important for our generation to understand is that a company is not built with money, it's built by people, right? So if you accumulate the right kind of people with the right energy and alignment in a room, I think you can do great things. So we're very fortunate what started with me alone grew to more than 200 people volunteering their time for two to six months. And these were not random people, these were people from Tesla, Apple, Google, uh, Microsoft saying, we want to solve this problem, we're going to make it happen, right? Uh, we had a total of probably two, three thousand dollars in the bank <laughs> with, with all these people, but I think we, we did okay. 
and people loved working at Pran. Um, this is some of the messages I've gotten, you know, someone on Thanksgiving messaging saying, you know, they had to put up a sticker of what they're grateful for and they put up Pran. Um, or, you know, someone messaging me on a Sunday that I'm missing office, right? So I think these are for a company that had no money to expect to see these things from people of top talent. I think it spoke volumes about the fact that we were trying to do the right things. Um, by the way, at, at this whole time, no investor was willing to back us. People thought we're genuinely crazy. No, there's no market for this uh, that we're trying to build, but uh, I'll get to it. But um, I think in 2020, I was to graduate and COVID-19 hit. So in my last semester to come back, I had no graduation. But, and that's a screenshot of my graduation on my computer at the, at the bottom. But um, during that time I came back, we had just tried to raise $1.3 million in funding. I had verbal commits and it died four days later when lockdowns were enforced. We were back to ground zero, right? Um, and I'd come to India, I could not pursue this company in the US where we had already built a lot of our, our infrastructure and, and hard work with the team. Um, and being here, we couldn't hire those people, right? So we started from ground zero. We realized a lot of people are getting laid off. So if you just use this opportunity to put it out that, hey, come build something crazy. And in exchange for your time, we're going to give you recognition on patents. And we honored that. And so just like that, we quickly in two months built another team of 67 people, top tier from 70 cities in the world. That's a map of where Pran talent comes from. Uh, you know, again, at no cost, but recognition on patents and career accelerant and making intros to the the best companies in the world after their time at Pran. And we've honored that. So we built a hardware company remotely with no money, um, right? Eventually in you know October, November, we raised our first round of venture capital from one of the top tier funds in the world. And we raised another round in January this year. So in, we've raised two consecutive rounds in a short period of time. So from December 2017 till June 2021, we were entirely bootstrapped. No venture funding, no investor money. I had borrowed 10 lakh rupees from friends and family and that was it, right? And so I had the two-year <laughs> opportunity to swim with sharks around the world. The venture capitalists, investors, um, you know, uh, in 2018, I tried to raise one crore rupees and, and soon found that uh, someone asked me for sole distribution rights of my company and to sell it for one crore, passed on it, uh, then raised 10 lakhs from friends and family. COVID tried to raise 1.3 million, fell. So look at that vertical drop. And slowly, slowly we get, got grants and, and other things. And uh, eventually, I think extreme right, you can see that we raised the uh, right kind of venture capital from the right people. And today we are blessed to be backed by top tier VCs, angel investors, and also have partnerships with Microsoft, Ansys, Autodesk, and, and several other companies. Um, and so here's where the fun part comes, right? We're a US company primarily operating out of India. We bring the money here and we try to build it out of here because we have a belief system that India is the best place to build climate tech out of, right? And that's not from a, a patriotic standpoint, just from a business standpoint as well, right? It's where you can build technology to be inexpensive and have mass scale impact even with fewer deployments. Right? And you can then, it's the hardest market to crack from a customer segment. You prove it here, you've proved it in most other places, right? So I think India is the place to build climate tech. It was a struggle, but hey, we're making in India. 95% of our product is made in Maharashtra and Gujarat. 5% are the chips, which we unfortunately don't make in India today. Uh, but it's a monumental task trying to get that Apple-like finish on the product and, and that look and feel and experience. And we're very fortunate to have a great team that pulled this off. Right? Um, I think, uh, yeah, so this is what we built. Meet Marco, and it's clean air per person per day at less than one rupee. So I told you we'd make it affordable to all, and, and we've, we've tried to honor that. So you don't buy one, you buy a cluster, and the cluster is tailored to the pollution dynamics on your site. Um, and yeah, happy to say that those pictures, the text is not visible, but it says made in India with love. And so, uh, this is the world's most advanced, truly filterless, large space air purification system. Um, and, uh, and I know my time's up, but we've already begun deployment in, in India earlier this year, in New Delhi, Mumbai, Gujarat, Nasik, um, and soon, hopefully, uh, in Jharkhand. Um, and so, I think just the message that I wanted to pass on for folks here is that everyone looks at climate tech as social work. Think of it as the hardest engineering and business challenge there is, right? 
Typically, a business just has to make a better product or service or a more inexpensive product or service or just a sustainable product or service. We have to beat everything out of the park for a product to be adopted in the market, right? So we have to build a product way better than what exists. It should be truly sustainable, like carbon negative, right? It has to be affordable so everyone can adopt it, right? And you need to learn to manufacture those things because many of those carbon negative manufacturing setups don't exist, right? And then you have to scale them very quickly. So it's no walk in the park if you break down each of these, they're a company by itself. I definitely want to encourage younger people to look at it as the greatest learning opportunity of this generation to learn and build something monumental uh, or impactful with it. And lastly, I think just from uh, uh, excite, making it more exciting and serious for everyone, and I think I made it gloomy, and unfortunately, but um, I think the earth will survive, we won't. But at the same time, we have the best opportunity of our lifetime to lead the next industrial revolution. So that's it. Thanks for having me.